The idea of selling one's soul comes from the medieval German legend of Faust, who made a pact with the devil at a crossroads, exchanging his soul for unlimited knowledge and worldly pleasures. Things didn't work out quite so well for Faust, and in the roughly 500 years since, there have been many people who are said to have sold their souls, including musicians such as Robert Johnson, Bob Dylan, and the great Italian violinist Niccolo Paganini. Those are all urban legends, but these days, the term is more commonly deployed to refer to someone who is deemed to have soiled their principles or reputation in exchange for something more tangible, typically either financial gain or some kind of career progression. As far as I'm aware, there are no professional footballers who have actually sold their souls to the devil, although, come to think of it, Joe Linton did seem to get freakishly good mysteriously quickly last season, which is a bit curious, but nonetheless, it is that second interpretation of the term that we will be focusing on. Just because I suspect that this might crop up a fair bit in the comments, John Terry doesn't feature, despite shilling worthless NFTs to children, because you cannot sell something that you never had. Here are seven footballers who I think sold their souls, figuratively speaking at least. 7th. Lionel Messi. I know that it is blasphemous within the world of football to criticise Lionel Messi, but no matter how gifted he may be at football, that does not make him immune from scrutiny. In fact, if anything, the fact that Messi is so tremendously talented, and is therefore idolised by millions, if not billions of people across the globe, and is fantastically rich, means that he deserves to be scrutinised even more so than most. One thing that has always marked Messi out, aside from just his talent, has been his relatively unblemished reputation. Despite being incredibly famous, there have never been too many scandals surrounding the Argentine, in emphatic contrast to fellow Argentine great Diego Maradona. Messi has always been fairly quiet, reserved, and has avoided the public eye. Unlike Cristiano Ronaldo, with whom he has so often been compared over the last 10 to 15 years. Even on the pitch, Messi has always been more likeable to much of the general public than the likes of Ronaldo or Neymar, perceived at least as tending not to dive, harass the referee, or engage in the dark arts of football quite as often. Of course, there are one or two exceptions, such as his handball against Espanyol 15 years ago, or his tax fraud conviction in 2016. However, Messi was far from the only player to be caught up in that scandal, it seemed to be just about everyone in La Liga, meaning that he came out of it relatively unscathed. It would have been easy, therefore, for Messi to have gone down as quite possibly the greatest footballer of all time, whilst being almost universally loved, or at the very least liked, and stinking rich, solely off the back of his ability. Last year, for example, Messi earned $122 million, the second most of any athlete on earth behind LeBron James, and his estimated net worth of $600 million is the second most of any active athlete on the planet, trailing only Tiger Woods. Quite why, therefore, Messi felt the need to become the face of Saudi tourism a couple of months ago, less than a year after signing for Qatari and PSG, I am not quite sure. Well, I suppose I am, greed is the only explanation, unless you choose to believe that Messi is just really, really passionate about people taking summer holidays to Jeddah and is promoting the brutal Middle Eastern dictatorship pro bono. Somehow, I doubt it. And it is Messi's extraordinary wealth that makes it so inexplicable to me. You would think, at some point, when you have enough money to shower in gold and spend five nights at centre parks without even having to remortgage your house, and your unborn grandchildren, and most likely their own grandchildren after them, if the planet is still habitable that far in the future, won't have to work a day in their lives, that at that point, you might deem the reputational damage of associating oneself with possibly the most despicable regime on the planet, in light of the war in Yemen, the murder and dismembering of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, and recent crackdowns on any and all dissenting voices, would outweigh whatever ungodly amount of money Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and his stooges must have offered him. Well, 
Apparently not. I know some people in the comments will point to Cristiano Ronaldo's similar relationships with Emirati Royals and his close ties with Dubai. But honestly, who can say they are surprised by that? As I said, Messi was long perceived as having been less corrupted than many of his peers, either rightly or wrongly, which somehow makes his deal with a regime far worse than the devil, all the more unedifying. Before Messi travelled to Saudi Arabia to announce his new partnership with the kingdom, the families of political prisoners in Saudi Arabia co-authored an open letter to him in which they wrote, quote, If you say yes to visit Saudi, you are in effect saying yes to all of the human rights abuses that take place today in modern Saudi Arabia. But if you say no, you will send an equally powerful message that human rights matter, that decency matters, that those who torture and murder do not do so with impunity. The world must stand up to those who trample on others. End quote. Messi said yes. So, whilst I am grateful for the sheer genius and inspiration that he has brought to the sport of football, he gets us started. Sixth, Rude Hullet. A fabulously complete footballer, there was virtually nothing on a football pitch that Rude Hullet couldn't do. Capable of leading a line, playing anywhere in midfield, and even as a sweeper later on in his career, Hullet was big and strong, but also elegant and inventive, and equally proficient at either scoring or creating goals. Off the pitch, Hullet's views have always seemed to be a little bit muddled. He is often credited as having coined the phrase, politics and football don't mix, yet in 1987, when he won the Ballon d'Or and was named as the best footballer in Europe, he sent shockwaves through the sport by dedicating his award to Nelson Mandela. That might not seem particularly controversial now. These days, Mandela is considered to be a wholly benevolent and positive figure by most people. But just like Martin Luther King Jr. and the women's suffrage movement, that wasn't always the case. Mandela was still imprisoned at the time, and he wouldn't be released for another three years when apartheid formally came to an end. Most Italians had never even heard of him, with Hullet playing in Italy at the time. Margaret Thatcher, the United Kingdom's Prime Minister, described the ANC, of which Mandela was a part, as a terrorist organisation, and the United States still had Mandela on their terrorist watch list until 2008, 18 years after he was released from prison, and 14 years after he had been elected as President of South Africa. It was a brave, bold, and principled stance from Hullet, and though he claimed that it was a social problem rather than politics that he was shining a light on, there was very little precedent for it, and some feared that it could even see him stripped of his Ballon d'Or. Fast forward 20 years, and following a disastrous spell managing LA Galaxy, Hullet took two and a half years out of management before agreeing to an 18-month deal with Tarek Roshni, now known as Akmat Grozny, or officially Republic Football Club Akmat. Now, I have made an entire video about Akmat Grozny, which is worth watching if you haven't already seen it, but the TLDR is that the club from the Chechen capital is run by Chechen dictator, strongman, and Putin puppet Ramzan Kadyrov, who is pictured here alongside Hullet. Kadyrov is renowned for his flash lifestyle his anti-LGBT views and extrajudicial killing of homosexuals, and for using celebrities and, particularly footballers, in an attempt to whitewash his regime and its international reputation. Upon taking the job in Grozny, Hullet was honest enough telling the Daily Mail that, quote, The money is good, I'm not going to lie. I'm here for that and the adventure. End quote. Comments which, reportedly immediately irritated Kadyrov. Ultimately, the whole thing would end in tears. As Grozny's results under Hullet were terrible, Kadyrov accused Hullet of being more interested in bars and nightclubs than he was in football, and Hullet having to enlist the help of the LMA to try and recoup what he felt he was still owed by the club when he was sacked after just five months in charge. Fifth, Jamie Redknapp. Okay, this is... A slightly more light-hearted one sandwiched between some pretty heavy inclusions because I don't want to deal solely with dictators, despots, and fascists. Jamie Redknapp was a very talented footballer whose career was blighted by injuries, meaning that 
He only ever won 17 caps for England, and he was forced to retire from football at the age of only 31. Following his premature retirement, perhaps feeling shortchanged at having missed a few years of earnings, Redknapp has made a point of never saying no to advertising any business, promoting any event, or endorsing any product. Alright, I don't actually know that for a fact, but it sure seems to be the case. I reckon if you offered him enough, he would be happy to sell cyanide to schoolchildren. I will retract that, just in case it is actionable, but you get the idea. As part of this segment, I did try to research every brand that Redknapp either is currently or has ever advertised, but after three weeks without any sleep, and having filled out eight notebooks, I decided that the task was simply too great and that I would have to do some other work. Among his best known paps are Sketchers, Thomas Cook, Paddy Power, L'Oreal, The Nintendo Wii, Drummond Park, Becco, and Burton's Menswear. In addition to having his own fashion brand called Sandbanks, where you can pick up a puffer jacket, often worn by Redknapp, Mika Richards, and Jamie Carragher on Sky Sports, for as little as £795. Bargain. The company through which Redknapp is apparently paid for his various endorsement deals and for his work on Sky Sports, reportedly saw in pocket £1.6 million pounds in 2020. Sadly, despite me wishing to steer clear of dictators, despots, and fascists, as I made clear at the beginning of this segment, during my three weeks researching everything brand Redknapp has touched, I did discover that he has also been commissioned to make two television programs around the 2022 World Cup, not investigative work into the treatment of migrant workers, you will be surprised to discover, but one of which is actually a travel log with his father Harry, produced by Jack Whitehall's production company, Jackpot, which is a three-part series which will see the father and son duo travel to the Western Asian shakedom to, quote, explore the local culture. Jackpot indeed. Fourth, Franz Beckenbauer. It is hard to imagine a more universally respected footballer than Franz Beckenbauer. Not only is he widely regarded as having been the greatest defender of all time and the finest exponent of the sweeper position, Der Kaiser was also admired, even by rivals, for his outstanding bravery and leadership. At the 1970 World Cup, for example, Beckenbauer dislocated his shoulder in the semi-final against Italy, which became known as the game of the century, but played on regardless, as West Germany had already used both of their substitutes. He spent the rest of that game carrying his dislocated arm in a sling. Not only that, after having won, quite literally, every major trophy available to him with Bayern Munich and West Germany, as captain of his club and country, Beckenbauer then enjoyed significant success in management, winning a league on title with Marseille, the Bundesliga and the UEFA Cup at Bayern Munich, and the World Cup with Germany at Italia 90. Benjamin Franklin supposedly once said, It takes many good deeds to build a good reputation, but only one bad one to lose it. And Franz Beckenbauer is an excellent illustration of that fact. I must be careful with what I say here because Beckenbauer's five-year trial on corruption charges ended without a verdict after the statute of limitations expired, which means that, much like O.J. Simpson, Beckenbauer is officially innocent. Well, that's not quite true. Simpson was acquitted of the murders in a criminal court, but found responsible in a civil trial, but you get the idea. FIFA's own investigation into Beckenbauer also had to be brought to an end in 2021, also due to the statute of limitations expiring despite the fact that the 10-year limitation in question was only actually introduced by the organisation in 2018. Beckenbauer was initially banned by FIFA in 2014, and in 2016, formal proceedings were opened against him due to accusations that he had paid Qatari former FIFA executive Mohammed bin Hammam £8.4 million before the World Cup. In 2019, Beckenbauer faced a fresh set of accusations, this time relating to an alleged €3 million Euro payment in exchange for voting for Russia to host the 2018 World Cup, followed by a further €1.5 million Euro payment. 
Whether Beckenbauer, a very wealthy man and one of the greatest footballers of all time, sold his soul, I'll let you decide. I couldn't possibly comment since the statute of limitations on the transaction has unfortunately expired. Third, Ronaldinho. Yeah, this one hurts. Those of you who are a similar age to me, and just anyone who is old enough to have watched Ronaldinho in his pomp, most likely feel an innate love and affection for the Brazilian. He pulled off flicks and tricks in World Cup and Champions League knockout stage ties that most footballers wouldn't even dare to attempt in training, and he did it all with a smile on his face. At his best, in the early to mid-2000s, Ronaldinho was like poetry in motion, beating players, scoring and creating goals at will, and making it look as though the ball was permanently glued to his foot. However, he was never really known for being the most committed professional and having mastered the sport and become the best player on the planet for at least two seasons, Ronaldinho lacked the sheer drive and determination that we have more recently seen from the likes of Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo to keep on thriving at the very highest level. Whilst Ronaldinho was never explicitly political, unlike some of his teammates, there was an assumption based upon his upbringing, his carefree attitude and his party lifestyle that he was probably of a somewhat Socratic persuasion, and by that, I mean Dr. Socrates of Brazil, rather than the Socrates of ancient Greece. There was a fair amount of shock, therefore, in Brazil, when during the 2018 presidential election campaign, Ronaldinho threw his weight behind the far-right populist candidate, Jair Bolsonaro. Ronaldinho was far from the only footballer to back Bolsonaro, the likes of Rivaldo, Kaká, and Cafu all did likewise. But support from evangelical Christians, a section of the electorate that Bolsonaro, much like Trump, had very effectively mobilised, and those from more affluent backgrounds, given Bolsonaro's reputation for championing the rich, came as less of a shock. Ronaldinho, on the other hand, was the son of dockyard workers, his father having died when he was only eight years old, who grew up in crippling poverty in Porto Alegre. Bolsonaro, who is pro-torture, has defended Brazil's former military dictatorship and claimed that he wouldn't accept the outcome of any election that he didn't win, has previously said that he would rather his son die in a car crash than date another man, and that the black Brazilian descendants of slaves, quote, don't do anything. Given that Ronaldinho himself is the descendant of black Africans, his endorsement seemed all the more unusual. Bolsonaro won the election in 2018, largely because of a corruption scandal surrounding the Workers' Party, Bolsonaro's promise to be tough on crime, and the fact that the most popular left-wing politician in Brazil, Lula, was banned from running. Bolsonaro's approval ratings are in the bin now, though, with Lula strongly anticipated to defeat him in Brazil's upcoming elections in October. Second, Alexander Villaplan. One of the first footballers that I ever wrote about, in an article for the website that I started to first try and showcase my work and get a job writing about football, Alexander Villaplan is one of football's most infamous rogues. He capped in France at the very first World Cup in Uruguay in 1930, and in what was actually the first ever FIFA World Cup match between France and Mexico, which his side won 4 1, in the opening game of that tournament. Villaplan won 25 caps for France in total and represented the likes of Nîmes, Racing Paris and Nice at club level before ending his career in prison in 1935, aged 30, after he was given a prison sentence for his role in a horse race fixing scandal. That isn't what makes Villaplan such a notorious rogue, however. That would come following Germany's successful invasion of France in 1940. By this stage, Five years after his retirement from football, Villaplan was very much part of the Parisian underworld, which brought him to the attention of the Carlanga, a group of French auxiliaries who worked for the Gestapo, which was run by two French gangsters, and was renowned for racketeering gold merchants and the local Jewish population. 
in addition to leading a counterinsurgency movement against the French resistance movement which opposed Nazi rule and the puppet Vichy government that had been imposed upon them. Villaplan came to lead the Karlanga's North African division, made up of North African migrants, as Villaplan began wearing an SS Untersturmfuhrer uniform and earned the nickname SS Mohammed. Villaplan is best known for having led the massacre at Orador Suglan, in which his men hunted down and massacred 52 people in the commune of Musidan. Following the Normandy landings and the liberation of France, Villaplan was arrested and sentenced to death for his involvement in the murder of at least 10 people. He was executed by firing squad on December 26, 1944, two days after his 40th birthday. First, David Beckham. That's right, in top spot, and therefore definitely worse than an actual Nazi collaborator, is David Beckham. As with Ronaldinho, given my age, and indeed my nationality in this instance, David Beckham was quite simply the biggest footballing icon throughout the entirety of my childhood. He had the ups and downs of getting sent off at the 1998 World Cup, that unforgettable free kick in stoppage time against Greece to take us to the following World Cup, and then redemption against Argentina in 2002, making Beckham just iconic. So much so that he became by far the most marketable footballer to have ever lived. The consequences of that, along with a series of smart business decisions, made Beckham the highest earning footballer on the planet for more than a decade, and one of the wealthiest athletes to have ever lived. Between them, David and his wife Victoria are worth an estimated $900 million, making them very nearly billionaires. You might think, therefore, that David could afford to be quite picky when it comes to who and what business deals he enters into, but it would seem, so long as the price is right, old Golden Balls, as he used to be known, would happily appear in an ISIS recruitment video, or even in a video alongside James Corden. I regret to inform you that Bex has actually done one of those things, and it is the least forgivable of the two. Multiple times. I should point out, again, just because I can imagine him being quite litigious, I am not suggesting that David Beckham supports ISIS, ISIL, or any form of radical Islamist jihad. In fact, I obviously don't think that, because the joke wouldn't work if he did. If Bex did actually adhere to a very literal form of Salafi jihadism and sought to create a global caliphate by any means necessary, then him appearing in an ISIS recruitment video would, if nothing else, at least be a principled stance based upon deeply held beliefs. But I don't think that David Beckham is at all committed to any form of jihad, hence why I said that he would only do it if the price was right. I'm really glad that I was able to clarify that point. The reason that Beckham tops this list is because, despite having more money than he could ever wish to spend in a hundred lifetimes, and the fact that he is still earning hundreds of millions of dollars through his various business interests and endorsement deals, with the likes of H&M, Breitling, Sainsbury's, Armani, Gillette, AIA Group, PepsiCo, and Adidas, he still felt it necessary, or at the very least desirable, to sign a £150 million 10-year deal with the Qatari government, which includes becoming the ambassador of the 2022 World Cup. A World Cup in Qatar, for a variety of reasons, should never have happened. From a ludicrously corrupt bidding process to a mound of human rights abuses, including the migrant labour that has been used to construct the tournament's stadiums, and related infrastructure projects, which has reduced workers to the status of indentured servants at best, if not outright slaves at times, all of which I covered in this feature-length documentary. Buying off FIFA and subjugating workers was very easy for the Qatari dictatorship. The one problem that they had was their image. Whilst not reported nearly as often as it should be, Qatar's numerous human rights abuses are still fairly common knowledge, with boycotts of the tournament and its sponsors threatening to undermine the project. Beckham, as the most recognisable face in all of world football, and as someone who is still quite broadly well-liked, 
has chosen to lend legitimacy to this festival of sports washing in a country that criminalizes dissenting voices, requires women to have male guardians, and where same-sex sexual conduct between men is still punishable by up to seven years in prison, or, technically, is punishable by death for Muslims. Beckham has always been hyper-commercial, so perhaps his deal with the Qataris should come as little surprise. But personally, I find the whole thing pretty unedifying. Bex is among the most famous people on the planet. He has the opportunity to use his platform to shed light on things like human rights abuses, but instead he uses it to make a further £150 million that will not change his life in the slightest in exchange for doing the bidding of some of the very worst people in the world. I hope that it was worth it. Maybe now he will be able to buy a super yacht with another yacht that is able to fit inside the swimming pool on that first yacht. I hear that that kind of thing can get quite expensive. That is it for my seven and probably enough moralizing from me for at least a couple of months. I hope that it didn't come across as too preachy, I suspect that to some of you it will have done and for that I apologize. I don't apologize, however, for calling Messi or Beckham greedy and morally bankrupt or for saying that being friends with James Corden is explicitly worse than recording a recruitment video for ISIS. There were a lot, lot more than seven candidates for this seven. I received over a hundred responses on Twitter alone, including someone who said Christian Eriksson and claimed that he faked his cardiac arrest at Euro 2020 to get out of Inter Milan and eventually to manufacture a move to Manchester United. I don't think that that's true, hence why I didn't include him, but if you are going to buy into conspiracy theories where there is absolutely no evidence that the thing in question is actually the case, then I do appreciate people at least believing in absolutely mental ones like that. Gary Neville was extremely fortunate to miss out given his shilling for Qatar along with Bex and his repeated criticism of owners whilst his best mate Peter Lim rips the very heart out of Valencia and he says absolutely nothing. Meanwhile, I left the likes of Oscar, Hulk and Paulinho, who a lot of people suggested on Twitter, viewing them as having been, you know, players that made moves that were detrimental to their careers from a footballing perspective, but very beneficial financially, as well as leaving the likes of Luis Figo, Sol Campbell and Michael Owen, who also got lots of suggestions on Twitter, out for joining rival clubs because I just think that the seven I picked were all much worse culprits in terms of selling their souls. I mean, one of them did literally collaborate with the Nazis and led death squads which murdered resistance fighters during World War II. Even the most diehard of Tottenham fans would surely have to concede that that is worse than Sol Campbell joining Arsenal on a free. No? Uh, well, alright, maybe not, but I'm not a Spurs fan, so I am able to be extremely objective about these things. That is it for today's video. I thoroughly hope that you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC 7s. You can also find me on social media, on either Twitter or Instagram, via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so. Cheers.